you know, the, the trouble, oh, I'm supposed to unwire, I guess. I <laughs> so the, the trouble with those kind of <clears throat> hyperbolic in, introductions is that it, it's all downhill from here. <laughs> uh, and in fact, I'm going to cover uh, some of the same material that, that David did. Um, but anyway, um, uh, thanks, David. Uh, I'd like to offer my thanks, too, to the well, the Montana Standard in the person of David McCumber and to Carson Becker of the Root and Bloom Collective um, for their invaluable help in some historical research that I did. I'd like to thank Ellen, uh, Kim, and Mariah of the Butte Silver Bowl uh, Archives, and specifically for, to Mariah for her excellent directions to Mr. Dodd, which I was able to find uh, last night which is uh, the guy who had Spagatini's years ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I tracked him down like a rabbit sheep killing dog and got a great meal there uh, <laughs> yesterday. <so. laughs> uh, in reviewing the scope of this talk, uh, I was flipping through the pages, I realized that it, were it to be summarized, it might charitably be described as rambling. <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to cover all the bases, um, so I would ask your indulgence as we, uh, as we set out, and for your forgiveness here at the outset for the ostensibly crude nature of the following remarks <laughs> regarding medical history and the mutability of language, which I'll discuss later. <laughs> In the early 1700s, physicians in their treatment of everything from drowning to typhus, from drowning to typhus, constipation, bad humors, maladies of the internal organs, would insert a bellows into, let's call it the nether region of the patients, and introduce tobacco smoke into the bowels. Uh, the practice, as you might imagine, was ineffectual, uh, but it gave rise to the colorful phrase to blow smoke up one's ass, <laughs> which, <laughs> which uh, has over the centuries transmogrified to mean to lavish undue praise on the audience or to inflate their ego, get it? <laughs> so I would like to assure you that it's not my intention to do this metaphorically or otherwise uh, to this gathering of Butte natives. Uh, when I say that Butte, is my favorite city in Montana by a long shot, um, favorite city in the U.S. and uh, in the top five cities of all of those that I've visited home and abroad. As I've obviously not visited every city in the world, uh, this is not scientific, but visceral. Uh, and that's how beauty is, it grabs you by the guts, as some of you non-natives know who, who have wound up here and won't probably leave. <laughs> It's his, in its history and diversity, Butte I've always thought of as a micro version of New York City or Boston. And I think this is why it's always appealed to me. It's a macro version of the Zupan ancestral home of the Tri-Cities area, that is Centerville, Stockton, and San Cooley. Mining towns <laughs> all. <laughs> and they're like faceted gemstones that gleam with a multitude of ethnicities, all contributing to make a complex and dazzling whole. Perhaps because of the shared hardships of mining, or perhaps the era preceded uh, the political correctness of today, which is now at a level of fragility akin to crystal stemware, <laughs> I would submit that ethnic slurs of 100 or 50 or 30 years ago uh, were unheard of. You were a mech, a hunky, a dago, a squarehead, a kraut, harp, bohunk, polop, wop. There was McCosker, Menacucci, Stagnoli, Smilinich, Leitinen, Powers, Kaloy, Troblia, Zelinsky, all these names that you wouldn't see on the PGA Tour probably. <laughs> <laughs> it was a more generous age, I think, than the one we find ourselves in now, one in which you could be proud of your heritage while acknowledging without rancor the right of your neighbor to be proud of theirs. I often would quiz my students as to the ethnic origin of their surnames, and too often I was met with a blank stare or a shrug of the shoulders, which was kind of dismaying, but now I tell myself that maybe this is a good thing, 
part of the natural process of the world's greatest melting pot, there are no longer really Slovenian Americans or African Americans, Irish Americans, Mexican Americans, or for that matter, Syrian Americans, but merely Americans. Nowhere is that more in evidence than here in Butte. Every ethnicity is a dash of spice that makes America that incredibly rich and unique stew that it is. More than ever, I think that's imperative that we remember this. So in keeping with covering all the bases, I, I wanted to talk about my briefly my own connections to Butte, which are myriad, some relatively recent, some over 100 years old. At UM and undergraduate school, all of the guys that I met from Butte became friends, with the notable exception of one reprobate who, and, I, and I'm not <laughs> making this up, uh, had a procri proclivity for drinking sterno. Oh. Uh, in retrospect and in fairness, wow. it, that couldn't have been terribly salubrious uh, <laughs> to the circuitry of his clearly already addled brain. <laughs> uh, I dated a girl from Butte until she came to her senses. <laughs> and I never came through Butte without visiting the Bronx. And uh, when that closed, it was very traumatic to me. I never quite recovered from that. <laughs> In the archives, thanks to the help of uh, many of these wonderful ladies, I discovered the Declaration of Intention for Citizenship document filed and viewed by my grandfather, John Zupan, on July 21st, 1916, in which he vowed, and this is great, to renounce forever all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty, and particularly to Francis Joseph, Emperor of Austria and Apostolic King of Hungary. <laughs> there were so, apparently so many Slovenes and Croats and Germans and Hungarians and Czechs uh, applying for citizenship at that time that they had made a rubber stamp with that said Franz Joseph and all of that stuff that they put in that space. <laughs> all great stuff you could find nowhere else but in Butte. It's, so it's not unusual, as you probably know, uh, for the husband to come to America first uh, during the great immigration wave and to send for his family once he'd settled. So having booked passage, my grandmother and three of my uncles were en route to America. Uh, and they got as far as Cherbourg, France, when my grandfather wired that they should wait because he was moving from Ely, Nevada to Butte. So my grandmother went to work temporarily in a textile mill and sold her tickets on a ship of the White Star Line of the Titanic. Oh my goodness. So wow. Zupan's wow. jeans could have been goggling at the bottom of the Atlantic <laughs> right now. Wow. So uh, a stroke of luck. Wow. Um, also, my uncle Al, who I never knew, uh, taught and coached here at Butte Central in the years before the war. Uh, he was a star halfback at MSU. <clears throat> and I'll be writing more about that for the paper, I hope, in days to come. Uh, so I won't go into that, but with the help of Mariah and Kim, I was actually able to find his apartment at 427 West Mercury, <laughs> wow. Wow. <clears throat> which was great. So enough about Butte for the moment, uh, I've blown enough smoke in that area. <laughs> I've been asked to talk uh, somewhat about my career as a writer, a far less exotic and interesting topic, I might add. Um, I began my college career at UM as a journalism major, but I shortly realized that I would be limited by and subsequently stultified by the facts. Uh, <laughs> furthermore, I, I worked slower than the second coming of Christ, so the deadlines would have been problematic. So I quickly moved to the English department and the creative writing program, where I'd be free to make up my own facts. <laughs> Fiction, as someone once said, departs from the truth in order to uh, intensify it, which I've always uh, appreciated and tried to follow. I should note here that my dad, God rest his soul, um, former coal miner veteran of um, the Battle of the Bulge, member of the Bobcat Hall of Fame, all through my undergraduate years would continue to tell his friends that I was a journalism major because <laughs> I think he thought there was some hope I could get a job uh, as a journalist. Um, I imagine you've all heard the English major jokes, my favorite being, 
please don't tell my mother I'm an English major. She thinks I play piano in a whorehouse in Wallace, Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I digress. So, um, as, as David said, interestingly, uh, he provided my first so-called break as a professional writer. Um, and uh, when he was the editor and publisher of Big Sky Journal, uh, initially it was not a magazine stuffed with real estate ads and sultry bottles dripping with turquoise, <laughs> uh, but instead had uh, high literary aspirations, which he was able to bring to fruition, actually. So as he said, he bought a fiction of nonfiction I wrote uh, about riding in a rodeo in Warwick, Montana, which is called a punk and rolling as a little rodeo east of Big Sandy. Um, and as he said, the short story uh, never ran in the magazine because of its so-called inflammatory, inflammatory nature. And just for the record, I never, I knew it was not your doing. Um, but, it, because it was, but it was a bold uh, acquisition on your part, and to my knowledge, you weren't drinking Sterno at the time. <laughs> um, anyway, the, uh, the story was set uh, in a, on a ranch east of Cascade, as David said, about a gay Mexican ranch hand, his employer, who was in love with him and uh, subsequently killed him out of jealousy. Um, a somewhat interesting sidebar, and also inflammatory here, um, but years ago I submitted this story um, in order to get into a residency at U Cross Wyoming. It was a writer's colony there, some of you may have heard of it. And um, at that time, sponsored by, and one of the readers was Annie Proof. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, a few years later, Brokeback Mountain came out, and as they say, the rest is history. I'm not drawing any conclusions here. <laughs> my youngest daughter still thinks Annie Proof owes her back pay for the college tuition. <laughs> <laughs> but I digress again. That's how a rumor starts. Wow. So like many artists and writers, as Dark and I were discussing the other evening, um, as so many writers and artists do, I've done a number of jobs over the years to keep the wolves at bay. I worked at the Anaconda Company Smelter in Great Falls for a number of years before and during undergraduate school. $4.90 an hour, <coughs> big money. Um, I was a surveyor, I worked on ranches in the Judith Basin, and it was there north of Monarch, where after a long night with my arm deep in the hindmost regions of a cow, that I received a letter from Bill Kittredge, the grand old man of Montana writing, offering me a teaching assistantship at, uh, in the Master of Fine Art program at UM. Mm. That certainly changed the course of my life, and I have no regrets, but needless to say, no one was standing outside after graduation offering me a job as a writer. So, <laughs> so for 25 years, uh, with a brief three-year hiatus to fish and commercially in Alaska, I made my living and supported my family as a carpenter, as David said. The last nine years, up until a year ago, um, uh, an instructor of carpentry at Missoula College um, actually, the mother of one of my best students is here tonight, um, which, or today, which, which is gratifying. Thank you. Uh, for the bulk of the time, I was wearing a tool, tool belt. I worked for a man who had a doctorate in English literature, uh, who found the hallways of academe um, not to fit him as a person, and so he became a contractor. It was a perfect fit for me, as well as for another, a number of other writers, Neil McMahon, Fred Hayfley, the poet Dave Thomas, uh, one of the Smith brothers of movie-making fame, uh, to name a few. But it was a gig where after three months uh, off writing in the winter, I always had a job at the end of that time, when the checking account was mostly red and the <laughs> children were eating mashed yeast and bowls of steam. <laughs> it was sort of like a blue collar NEA grant. Carpentry <laughs> uh, is a, an essential and noble trade, don't get me wrong, and I was fairly good at it, but I never in all of those years thought of myself as a carpenter who wrote, but rather 
as a writer who did carpentry. It was a subtle but important distinction for me and one vital to my mental health. Writing, as they say, is a terrible way to make a living, but a wonderful way to make a life. Hmm. The act of writing a novel is incredibly boring. Uh, long hours of sitting and staring and gnashing of teeth, rending of clothing, sitting and pacing some more. I've met some writers with large egos, and that's befuddling to me. They're either blessed with far greater talent, which is certainly a possibility, or are more agile in the art of self-deception, because the act is, for me at least, one beset with frequent defeat and humiliation. There are moments, of course, epiphanies, breakthroughs, those occasions when the brain and emotion and words miraculously coalesce. And of course, those rare moments are what keep you going and put off madness, at least for the moment. <laughs> I think of myself as a fairly sane and well-adjusted uh, person. I don't wet the bed, I don't beat my wife, I don't kick the dog. <laughs> my children are good people, I have wonderful friends. But I can tell you with no little amount of embarrassment that the act of writing at times comes very close to making me crazy. For me at least, as far as the discussion of the craft, is this thing making weird noises or is that just me? Just you. Just me? Yeah, okay. I, You're I, fine. I frequently <laughs> hear weird noises. Yeah. <laughs> Just when I turn? When you turn your head. Yeah. You're on the line. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Just stay perfectly um, still. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that'd be easier to do if, you know, let me just say the bathrooms were closed when I got here. <laughs> <laughs> you take it from there. <laughs> uh, so as far as the discussion of the craft of writing, uh, I would only say that it requires a kind of crazy doggedness and an ability to stop your ears to extraneous metaphorical noise. Most of the time you need to employ a ridiculous self-belief in the face of a great body of evidence that would say you won't make it. <laughs> I tell young writers that their stories about Haber or Butte or Glasgow are every bit as important and essential as those coming by the thousands from the left or right coasts. If Faulkner had believed rural Mississippi was not as valid in its universality as London or Paris or New York, he would have remained a morose alcoholic janitor instead of becoming one of our greatest morose alcoholic writers. <laughs> <laughs> Though Miner's medium uh, is rock, his tools, the pick and drill, a farmer dirt with his plow and shovel for the writer, Words and language are the medium and the keyboard the tool. I'd like to close with a few observations about the English language, or more accurately, the American language. Two years ago, I was asked to give the commencement speech for the English department at, UN, at UM, and I admonished graduates to be keepers and preservers of the language, because I truly fear for it. It's assailed every second by tweets, God help us, and texts and the grotesque jargon of the small and ubiquitous machinery that we hold in our hands and laps. True, we are able to showcase our enviable use of opposable thumbs with our LOLs and our WTFs and our OMGs, yet we threaten every second to lurch back irretrievably toward the mutterings of apes. Compare just one heart-cracking letter from the lowest fifth grade Civil War s soldier with the average text mail, text message or email, and I think you'll get the sense of how threatened our language is. There's a special seat in hell I would submit for the inventor of the emoji. <laughs> <laughs> that shorthand replicant for emotion. No symbol or line of exclamation points can ever substitute for the thoughtful juxtaposition of tender words. There are, by one recent count, 1,025,109 words in the English language. It's an incredible palette. Every time we dumb down a sentence to the lowest common denominator, our ability to write and the language atrophies like a broken leg in a cast. In the course of soliciting blurbs for the plowman, a very famous Pulitzer Prize winning uh, novelist, I was somewhat acquainted 
with castigated me for using the word refulgent and went on to note with disapproval several other less accessible words. I mean, there's not a thing in the world wrong with that word, and I was and remain unrepentant. <laughs> when we study a foreign language, uh, we attempt to learn new words uh, and phrases as part of the process, do we not? Yet people bridle and piss and moan like there's no tomorrow and having to look up a word in their own language that they're not familiar with. I mean, I don't get it. Certainly there's a fine line between a, a, you know, a, a colorful, vivid brush stroke um, and the excessive use of arcane or seldom used words that veer into George Willian uh, tendency. <laughs> that kind of I'm smarter than you showing off and that should be avoided. But I'm convinced that the only way to keep language alive is to use it and to use all of it. Language in, is fluid and vital. Uh, note here the evolution of the crass phrase that I began this talk with a few minutes ago. Um, it's ever changing. And uh, since I've begun this rant a few short minutes ago, new words have probably already sprung to life that will take their place in the American lexicon. And this is good, as it should be. I'm only saying that while we embrace the fresh-faced newborn, we must not turn away from the doddering eccentric uncle with his <laughs> dirty cardigan and troubling drool. <laughs> My fear for language has, in the last four months or so, taken a turn for the profound. When we see the holder of the highest office in the land messaging, and there's a word that I've come to despise, by the way, right alongside awesome. <laughs> God in his heaven is awesome, and that's where it should stop. Right there. But I digress. Um, anyway, when, when we see people in power using misspelled words and non-words, like bigly, for example, it, it somehow legitimizes a trend towards anti-intellectualism. In the interest of full disclosure, I should say I'm a kind of a curmudgeon in this regard. I once sent a birthday cake back to the baker because they failed to put a comma behind between happy birthday and mom. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have to draw a line in the sand somewhere. <laughs> Just as thinly veined, racist, veiled racist remarks from persons in authority legitimize, legitimize racism. So does slaughtering of the English language lead to its very erosion. And I want to go on record as saying my fear and revulsion at these trends is not a product of partisan politics. If I were around when Thomas Jefferson or JFK or Martin Luther King referred to something as awesome, I would just have the same sense of outrage. Words and those who use them professionally wield enormous power and require of us great responsibility. They can be used like a club, but also like a scalpel, like a balm or a cool cloth to serve to, so, to salve the troubled brow, to expose and countervail a darkness. The pen mightier than the sword. The truth of it is it's mightier than an M1 Abram or an F-15 on full afterburners with a belly full of missiles. Think of the power of Ich bin ein Berliner, for example, or Jacques Hughes. Hands up, don't shoot. Je suis Charlie. Language can and should be used to carpet bomb the bejesus out of dunderheadedness, injustice, and bigotry. Language and those who use it professionally are most decidedly not the enemies of the state, as some would have us believe, but rather the preservers of it. So this is a metaphor that I gotten fond of over the years that I'll close with at the at the foot of Vesuvius along the streets that had been excavated in Pompeii and Herculaneum were the strange prone shapes of men and women preserved under lava and ash. Among them no doubt many wealthy and influential people. When archaeologists looked inside these forms they found only a void. But on the entablatures of the buildings the chiseled words remain. People great and small, writers, carpenters, archivists, miners, journalists, we all revert back to dirt and ash, but the words remain. Thank you for coming. <laughs>
question and, and answer if anyone yes, yeah, talk course. back? Okay. So for anyone who has any responses, questions, how about it? Dark or is yes. it? Yes, this young lady right yeah. here. Thanks for the young part. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I was just wondering when these essays or whatever are going to appear in the book. Uh, oh. So I guess it's part of We will. Yeah. We will run no essay before it is written. Okay, so when are you going to write? Do you have a deadline or you said you're Don't use that word. I just told David, I, you know, I, I'm in the throes of a, of a revision myself, so I'd like to get this done in the next week or so, so I could... Uh, Mm -hmm. well, you you will beat our second and third writers and residents <laughs> if you do that. So that's, that's my goal. Okay. That's my goal in any case. So. Yes. Ma Can you just, in a few words, tell me what this book is about? You, you, you know, you think after all this time, I'm pretty good at that, but uh, I'm I'm not. But um, so. Um, the, the book was actually based roughly on uh, a real people. A good friend of mine was a Cascade County deputy many years ago, subsequently retired from the uh, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Bureau some years ago. Um, he was a sheriff in Cascade County, and there was this career criminal who was working and had worked in the West for 30 or 40 years, a uh, horrible guy who was busted in the course of his last job at the age of 77 or something, apparently didn't understand the concept of retirement. <laughs> um, but he was a terrible guy, a, you know, a hitman, serial killer kind of a guy. In any case, um, my friend was this kind of ostensibly guileless farm boy, uh, although he was very bright. The, the old man befriended him and so he they would sit late at night in the jail talking about this guy, some of these, this guy's crimes, and uh, my friend would tell me about these conversations, and it percolated in my head for many years, and so the book is kind of about the relationship with those two men, the sheriff and the mm. old criminal. Um, you know, the, my agent, when this first landed on his desk, to my great delight, called it a love story, and it kind of is between these two men, uh, and then there's women involved too. But, um, yeah, I, you know, I, is that okay? Yeah, that's know? fine. Yeah, I, yeah I, I love to read books, so I'm... Yes, ma'am. When did you first know you were a writer? You know, ever, since I was very young, I had a fascination with words and the sounds of words and how words kind of rang off each other. I think I always wanted to knew I always wanted to work with words. Um, and uh, so it's it kind of a curse from an early age. Um, and, uh, you know, plus it was, it was what I was good at, you know, so you always kind of cleave towards the things you're good at. And then, you know, I did some writing in high school, and by the time I got to college, I was, I was fully committed and so I really knew from a very early time, for good or ill. Yes? Is dialogue difficult in writing? Because in the plowman, you have all this dialogue it's going on. Dialogue, yeah. Yeah, and, but it's different for each person in a way. Do you have a special <coughs> hearing that you can hear? <laughs> you know, that's, that's a, a, a wonderful question. You know, Dialogue, <clears throat> as David would uh, attest, can be difficult. Um, oh, no. <laughs> you know, there are some really wonderful writers out there. Robert Stone comes to mind, who I, I think is terrific. But you listen to his characters talk, and you know, it's almost like they're all, you know, two doctorate candidates talking to, to each other. Um, um, so. I think it's just a matter of listening to people talk. People don't often talk in, frequently, don't talk in complete sentences. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of colloquialisms. Um, so I just try to listen to people, you know, when, I'm, when they're talking to me or I overhear a conversation. 
um, and kind of store that away in that you know, secret locker back there. Uh, and then, two, you have to pair the dialogue with the character as they develop in the in the story. You know, uh, for example, John Glow, the you know the killer is not going to talk like a doctoral candidate, right? And the, the sheriff, who's more educated, probably is not going to use colloquialisms as, as often. Um, so you kind of, it's just a, you know, it's part and parcel of the invention of the character. And as they develop, so does their, their language and their uh, language skills or lack thereof. So, so do you eavesdrop a lot? I do. I don't, <laughs> Yeah, let's do that. Anyway, uh, I do, and uh, yeah. So let's, let's not let this get out of the room. Here. Yes. What do you read for enjoyment or enlightenment these days? You know, I've become uh, so picky about what I read anymore. Um, that's a, a great question. I, you know, when I'm working on uh, something, I tend to go back and read the same books uh, frequently. I'll read the same book every two or three years that I admire, one that I admire that has a strong prose style uh, because it, it kind of inspires me. Um, you know, boy, uh, of late, you know, I'm, dr I'm drawing a blank. Um, mm -hmm. As far as uh, inspiration, as I say, I, I go back to books that I truly admire. You know, I read Cormac McCarthy. I think Cold Mountain was a terrific book of, of this little book called Tinkers. If you've never heard of it, it's a, it's a wonderful book. Are you familiar with that? Paul Harding. Um, I read Robert Stone. Um, you know, there's a, 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 a book that just came out recently, which I admire very much, is called North Water. It's by Ian McGuire, a, a Brit, um, with the delectable uh, plot line of a uh, serial killer aboard a whaling ship in the mid 1800s. So how could you not like that? <laughs> um, so, you know, I, maybe it's because of my full bladder I'm trying to flank. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I apologize. Well, for your sake, we can call the... Uh, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm only joking. No, okay. I, I did have a question. Yes, I, I was having a sympathetic response to your comments about the uptown water supply, so I can't resist. <laughs> 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 for no, I'm really, I'm fine. I, you know, okay. I, everything's great. <laughs> Yes, Ellen. You were actually were doing your research. Well, I'm thrilled that you found your family member in, in the natural station papers. And they were handwritten. Was your document handwritten? Right, it was a document with spaces yeah. that were handwritten yeah. right in this uh, very elegant, I might add, handwriting. Uh, beautiful handwriting. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we, we are so worried about, they don't teach cursive. And a lot of people, when they're doing a creative process, need to put the pen to the paper. Do you put the pen to the paper? You know, I... Now I feel guilty. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, I will, I will take notes uh, putting pen to paper, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I, I've got... I, at first I composed on it. I have to say with a certain level of embarrassment, hot pink Smith Corona typewriter. <laughs> uh, and then I, you know, I, I realized quickly, you know, I, I made all these kind of uh, derogatory remarks about technology and handheld devices and so on, but I realized very quickly that the computer is an incredible tool. Um, and so I compose, you know, I compose on a keyboard. I, you know, I am a Luddite, but not quite that bad. <laughs> and, you know, I have a, a method where uh, in an earlier draft, I'll, I'll uh, italicize, and then as it goes through another draft, I, it'll, I'll have it in um, unitalicized and then bold print three different ways to show the level at which the piece has arrived at various levels of doneness. As it <laughs> 
you know, it, not using a computer would be like using a stone axe when you go out to do carpentry. Right. It just doesn't make any sense. Right. Yes, sir. When you were talking about your grandfather, <coughs> what ethnicity was he? Uh, Slovenian. Slovenian, you know. The former my grandfather was Croatian, Melania. and they came about the same time yeah. to this country. Your grandfather was? <laughs> yeah. And your last name? Ugrin. Ugrin? Ugrin. Ugrin. Oh, Ugrin. Oh, of course. Um, yeah, we were just talking about how close everything is in that area. I mean, Austria, uh, two different forms I saw my grandfather used his hometown two different names. And I finally realized um, that it was just, one was a Slovenianized uh, version of the German name. So it was, when it was Austria, he wrote his hometown as German. Uh, it evolved to be Kron uh, in Slovenia, which is still Kron. So it was just a matter of who was wearing the crown at that time. <laughs> the same thing in my family. Yeah. There were Ugrins and Ogrins. And an oddity was, my dad was an ogre, mm. but we're all ogres. <laughs> 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 and one of his brothers was ogre, and three of them were ogres. Wow. wow. Yeah. That's got to keep you on your toes. <laughs> uh, as part of being a writer in residence, then people write something about you. What can you give us a clue in terms of what really stands out? you that you might be including in your essay on you? Uh, well, as I implied, and maybe this is utterly self-serving, but um, I'm going to write about my uncle who um, taught here at VU tonight. You know, I want David to sell a few papers, so I don't want to go into too much detail, <laughs> but, but um, I found some interesting things about him and his stay in Butte. And, um, the students he had and before the war and his time before the war. And then, you know, as I'm sure all of you know, one thing I discovered was there were, uh, from, from the years that he was at Butte Central, well, I should say, the, during the, uh, the number of kids from Butte Central High School who were killed during the war numbered 16. Mm. Um, just from those three years. And then I was able to find among those the, the, the students who have been his um, players on either the basketball or football team at, at Butte Central. So, um, anyway, yeah, so I you know, couldn't have done that anywhere but here. Great resources, yes ma'am. Do you have any techniques you could share with us for increasing one's vocabulary? <laughs> um, you know, I think by writing down words that you come across while reading and, and then looking them up later, I think too many people, and I'm guilty of that, I think we all mm -hmm. are, come across a word we're not familiar with and just kind of go, oh well, don't need that. You know, I can figure out what this sentence or this paragraph means. But I think if you write those down and make it a concerted effort to look them up, uh, that certainly helps. Um, you read George Will columns. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I've got a, a renewed uh, sense of uh, tenderness for George Will that I didn't have a few crazy months ago, but if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, but man, he's a tough one to get through. I, in undergraduate school, and I took a history class, and one of the textbooks was by this guy named Charles O. Lurch, Jr. I'll never forget it. It was the most impenetrable shit I've ever read. <laughs> if I met him on the street, I swear to God, I'd club him. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, a lot of words in there I learned, <laughs> despite myself. Um, so yeah, do the crossword puzzle. Do you do the crossword mm -hmm. puzzle? That's one way. There's also an app for it. Oh, wouldn't you know? Embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course there's an app. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Anything else? Well, I hope to, uh, hope to see you tomorrow night. And mm -hmm. uh, you have my great thanks for coming today. I sure appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.